All right. Uh, while I'm getting situated up here, if you guys have your Bibles, if you want to turn to Romans chapter 6. While you guys are getting there, I just want to say it's awesome to see you here, Brian. Come back anytime. <laughs> just had to point you out a little bit. All right, so anybody ever do any word association? Like somebody say a word and then you just say the first word that comes to mind? <laughs> it can be. I want to do some of that. What's the first word that comes to mind when you hear the word surrender? Freedom, that's a good one. Letting go. Does anybody have the word joy come to mind? Normally, when we hear the word surrender, we don't think of joy. Because we we hear that and we think, okay, well, it's like a a military type surrender or maybe like when the police catch the bad guy you know hands up you know freeze surrender to us sort of thing but we don't really think joy but i hope to change your mind tonight with that so here in romans chapter 6 uh, starting in verse 15 what then are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace by no means do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So, wow. Wow powerful set of verses right there and you probably think well he didn't say nothing about joy uh, there's no joy in that but we do see in this that paul's saying whatever we present ourselves to whatever we submit ourselves to that's what we're now a slave to whether it be to sin or whether it be to righteousness so that just knowing that Brings a few questions to mind. First question is, who do we surrender to? Who do we submit ourselves to? In Matthew 6, 24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, he's using God and money because in that particular section, they were talking about money. But you could technically put anything in place of money. Your job. People that you live with. People that, you know, you just know. Or possessions like cars or trucks or tractors or whatever it is. If, if you put that ahead of God, then technically you're serving that and not God. So you can't serve two masters, so we have to choose one. So that brings up another question, because we actually have three options. We can either surrender to Jesus, we can surrender to our flesh, or we can surrender to the devil. And he's like, oh, well, I thought you said there's only two options. Well, the flesh will lead you to the devil. Because our flesh, it's like gravity. If we don't fight against it, it's, it, it's going to continue to pull us down further and further and closer to the enemy. And 
Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it said, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do though do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You think, wow, that's a pretty big list. You see three different examples in there. You see like sexual sins, you see spiritual sins, and you see social sins. All of those are things that our flesh is pulling us towards all the time that we have to fight against. And even if you look at that list and go, yeah, I'm not really guilty of any of those. Paul puts that little catch-all in there, that things like these. So that list is actually much more extensive. He just didn't want to take the time to list every single possible fleshly sin. But there are a lot, for sure. And we are constantly fighting against them. And there is a great depiction of this in Zechariah chapter 3. <clears throat> verses, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 1 through 5. It says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan, standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. So in this scene, Joshua standing there. He's got the devil sitting here accusing him, railing against him, just everything he can throw at him. And you got the angel of the Lord. You got Jesus standing here. And in this particular case, this was a vision that the Lord had given Zechariah of Joshua to be the high priest. But this particular situation is what we face every day. Every decision that we have, we can either choose Satan or we can choose Jesus. It's not just a one and done, oh, I gave my life to Jesus, I confessed my sins one time, got baptized, and I'm good for the rest of my life. It's at every day. It's at every minute. It's at every second decision. Every time we are faced with any decision, that's our decision. We can choose the devil and our flesh and go in that direction, and we can keep our dirty clothes on and keep all those stains and all those sins that we get you know, made fun of for, or we can choose Jesus, and we can get clean clothes, and he can purify us. So we have to choose. There is no getting out of it. If you choose not to choose, then you're choosing Satan. You're choosing your flesh. So the next question would be what to surrender. In Matthew six thirty one through 33, it says, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So, Matthew's saying right there, or excuse me, Jesus is saying, anything in this earth, anything on this earth, we don't need to worry about it. God already knows what we need, and he will provide it for us. So, we should be ready, willing, and able to surrender everything that we have, every possession that we have, every dollar, every cent. In Proverbs 16, 3, it says, Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Another word for commit 
is to give, to obligate, to devote, to dedicate, to surrender. Your work, your work is anything that you do. It doesn't have to be a specific calling like a preacher or a pastor. It doesn't have to be anything like that. It can be your job. It can be the work you do around your house, raising your kids, fixing your house, fixing the stuff, whatever whatever it is, whatever work you are doing, surrender that to the Lord. Another good example of what not to do is like the parable of the rich young ruler. He came to the Lord and they were talking and the Lord told him, well, you have to give up everything. You have to sell your house, sell all your possessions, and then give all that money to the poor. Then he walked away sad. He wasn't willing to give it up. He couldn't. In, in his heart, he couldn't. But if you look at the disciples when Jesus first called them, that's a different ballgame. I mean, it says Jesus was just walking by and they were mending nets and he said, y'all want to be fishers of men? Come with me. And they dropped their nets instantly. They dropped everything and walked away. Said James and John, the sons of Zebedee, left their dad in the boat to do all the work. It was like, no, oh, we're done. We're following Jesus. Just dropped it. That's how we need to be. That's the one of the best examples of how we need to be from earthly men like us. So then the last question would be, well, how do we surrender? How do we do this? We know who to surrender to. We know what we should should bleh, getting tongue tied. We know what we should surrender, but how do we do it? Like, do we just throw everything down and walk away? In Proverbs six five through six it says, "Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight." So the first thing is it's a heart thing. You've got to be willing in here to give it all up. Matthew sixteen twenty four through twenty five. It says, and Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So we know then, following Jesus, we're going to have troubles, but we, we have to accept it. We have to go through that if we're going to follow Jesus. Hebrews 11, 6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So now we're back to faith and the heart issue. If your heart's not right, then you're not starting out very good. And that's that's great. And if your heart's right, then how do you get your flesh to follow your heart? Because Paul tells us later in Romans that when you do the things that you don't want to do, that's sin. But your flesh is constantly taking you away from the things that you do want to do, which is to follow the Lord. And around uh, 1890... Science finally caught up with the Bible. And I love it when this happens. Has anybody heard of a study around 1890 called Pavlov's Dog? There was a man named Ivan Petrovich Pavlov who discovered what has been coined as classical conditioning around 1890. Paul wrote Romans around 57 A.D. So that's about 1830-ish years later. But if you're not familiar with that, what Pavlov discovered 
he would feed his dog every day at the same time. So he got curious and he started ringing a bell every time he fed his dog. Do, do, do. Feed his dog. Did that day after day after day. And finally, he decided, I'm just going to ring the bell and see what happens. He rang the bell. The dog came running, drooling, ready to eat. The dog had a response that he could not control to the bell that he had been conditioned to. Just like Paul tells us, we are slaves to what we submit ourselves to. Pavlov, the man, submitted his dog to the bell for food. Bell, food, bell, food. When he took the food away and it was just the bell, the dog could not help but to respond the same way. We do the same thing. We condition ourselves every day. It's not up there anymore. I wish it was because then I could say it was up there now. But a few weeks ago, there was on the sign at Dairy Queen, it said, ice cream is cheaper than therapy. Cheaper than therapy. And it is. It is true. But what kind of conditioning is that? Oh, well, I, I don't need to go to the Lord with my problems. I don't need to pray about it. I don't need to do that. I don't need to go to a psychiatrist or a therapist. I just need ice cream. And before anybody gets mad, I'm not saying ice cream is bad. <laughs> I like ice cream. But when you go and you choose ice cream because you've had a bad day or whatever, you eat the ice cream and your brain secretes a little bit of dopamine. And then your body's like, hey, that was awesome. So the next bad day you have, the first response is, hey, let's go get ice cream. And it's a never-ending cycle until you get to a point where you're doing it without even thinking about it. Conversely, the opposite is true. If you have a bad day, something happens, instead of running to ice cream, you run to the Lord in prayer, you get that same dopamine hit. Now, you're retraining your body. You're reconditioning your body to run to the Lord every time you have troubles instead of something from this world or whatever your flesh wants. Now, it's not just as easy as what I said. I mean, there are things that can get us addicted and stuff like that that's very hard to break. So you will need the help of the Holy Spirit to do that with some things. And there are some things that what the Lord chooses, he will just deliver you from. And you won't want to go back to that. But a lot of the things will take some work from us, and it will take help from the Holy Spirit to recondition our bodies, to not instantly run to sin. Because when we do that over and over and over, like Paul says, it's lawlessness leading to more lawlessness. So first it's ice cream. Okay, that's not so bad. And then next thing you know, you're eating ice cream all the time. And then, okay, I really like ice cream, but now every time I have a problem, I'm eating a whole pint of ice cream. And then, oh, now I'm starting to have health problems. And oh, and it's just a cascading effect. And even if it's not ice cream, even if you say, okay, well, well maybe it's, I'm going to run to that woman over there or that man over there, then that becomes your dopamine hit. Or maybe it's social media. I'm going to sit here and scroll through social media, and I'm going to covet, and I'm going to lust, and I'm going to do all this for all these little dopamine hits. And then next thing you know, that's all you do. It's just a little lawlessness at first, 
leading to more lawlessness in the end. Because you go back to the scene in Zechariah where you have the devil and Jesus standing here. It's never that blatant. The devil never comes at us that blatant. It's always a little bit at a time. Just just, just a little bit. It won't hurt you. Just a little bit. But that little bit always snowballs into way more than what we ever expected. And some things get even worse. Because, like I said, our flesh is constantly pulling us down. So it may start as, you know, a little bit of fornication or something like that. Next thing you know, that's all you want. Now you have somebody running around that's, they're going to get it no matter what because that's their release and they're abusing women and it just gets worse and worse and worse. So we have to be vigilant in that part. We have to seek God all the time with everything because everything has a repercussion on the opposite side. So, you think, well, he still hasn't said anything about joy. He's just told me who and how and what and all this. But when we sur surrender to the Lord, that's where our joy comes from. It comes from the Lord. Because when we surrender, the Holy Spirit comes in and helps heal us and helps to turn us around. And even though we're talking about a joyful surrender, when the Holy Spirit comes in, now you can have a loving surrender, a patient surrender, and love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. You can put all those words in front of surrender when the Holy Spirit's involved because you will have all of that. And if you look, because we're going through Acts now, and if you just look at the life of the apostles in Acts, how they surrendered everything. Yeah, they got beat. They got thrown in jail and all this. But if they didn't have that joy, they wouldn't have ever kept going and kept persevering and going from town to town to town. And all that is because they surrendered to the Lord and Nothing over on that side. Nothing of the devil. And how this particular sermon, if you will, come about, uh, I was reading through, and there was one day I felt like the Lord had led me to read in Timothy. So it's like, okay, you know, so I'll read in Timothy. And the Sunday before, I had felt a push for him to, or not for him, but for me to give my testimony because Chelsea's dad had just passed away. And some things that happened while we were back, I was feeling led to give that testimony. But I didn't. I hesitated. And so when I was reading in Timothy, he was talking about... Uh, uh, Oh, what's the word he used? Don't uh, neglect the gift that was given to you. So I was like, okay, Lord, you know, you're. Uh, I'm going to take that as, you know, I messed up. I know I messed up. I should have come up here and I give the testimony like you wanted. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Yeah. So then the next day, it was another passage very similar out of Second Timothy. It's like, oh, wow, okay. Yes, Lord, I, I understand, you know, because I'm still thinking the testimony. So then the third day, which was a Thursday, this, this happened over Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, was a third passage out of Second Timothy saying the same thing. And it was like, wow, okay, yes, Lord, you know, I, I understand, I, I, I get it now. But I was not getting it because Friday, after I got home from work, because I usually get home early on Fridays, was sitting on the couch and something was just like 
you really need to go back and, and reread all of that. So I was flipping back through, and the Bible that I take to work is a little bit smaller so that it fits in my lunch bag, and it's a King James Version. Well, it just has little descriptions up at the top as to what that page is talking about. And for the most part, everything that he was showing me, the little description went right along with it and was like, okay, well, there was one, one of those days that I was reading in that Bible, and where I had started, it rolled over to the next page. So when I flipped the page, I was like, okay, I paid no attention to what was on the top. I was like, okay, Lord, you know, I, I see what you're saying and all this. Well, when I came home Friday, I got this ESV Bible, and it has the descriptions as you go through. So I was sitting there looking through, and it's like, okay, I see that one. But when I flipped to the one in Second Timothy that spanned two pages, right there, plain as day, it jumped off the page and hit me like a ton of bricks. The description for that section just said, preach the word. Whoa. I did not see that. It did not jump out at me. So I asked her, I was like, hey, can you grab my Bible out of out of my lunch bag and hand it to me? So I'm looking through, and I'm like, well, this one don't say that. I flipped the page, and at the top, it said, preach the word. Whoa, oh, whoa, okay. I need to do some praying about this, you know. So like, all right, so I started praying about it. And my prayers at first were, Lord, are you sure? Me? I don't know if I'm ready for this. You know, that's that's a big responsibility. I, I, you know, I don't know about all this, but if this is what you want, let me know, you know. And it's crickets, crickets, crickets. And, of course, me and Chelsea were talking about it and all this stuff. And finally, one day, it just don't know me it's like you know if the lord's opening this door and he has showed me this why am i hesitant to walk through it i shouldn't be that day my prayers changed lord if i'm seeing what i think i'm seeing and this is the door that you're opening I feel honored to be that man. I will gladly walk through that door. I will gladly stand up here and preach your word. Just show me what you want. And if it is what you want, show Pastor Rod and Nathan and our elders, show us all the way you want this to move forward. So when I quit making it about me, and I surrendered to the Lord. And I said, Lord, if this is what you want, I'm on board. I got a joy that I could not shake. And a peace come over me. And I'm like, that's my confirmation. This is what he wants. So I know he will lead us through. That was on a Monday. That Wednesday, Lonnie called me about leading communion. <laughs> More confirmation that he wanted me to start teaching God's word. I was like, wow. But this joy, like I could not shake it. Anything that was coming at me, like couldn't shake it. I'm like, okay, this is new. This is new. I'm enjoying it. It's new. She has one of the little Bible verse calendars that she keeps on, on the counter. And I was walking by there. And she hadn't changed it in, I don't know, it was several weeks she hadn't changed it. And I just happened to look, and it wasn't, wasn't the wrong date that caught my eye, but it was the scripture. And I was reading that, and it's like, that's my answer. It was Hebrews 12, 2. It said, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God 
how can he have the joy, joy of going to the cross unless he was fully surrendered to the Father? We have to do that. If we want that kind of joy, we have to do that. We have to surrender to what the Father wants. There's no other way. If you look even early on, like in Exodus, when the Israelites were out in the wilderness and they were just going in circles after circles after circles. I, I don't claim to be the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't God that was lost. I'm pretty sure it was the Israelites. And if, and if you read the full story, they were mumbling and grumbling like, oh, he's just giving us bread and water. Well, what about the meat? You know, maybe we should go back to Egypt. It was way better back there and all this. And So I could just imagine that from, from God's point of view. It's like, oh, well, y'all still haven't learned how to surrender. So we're going to make a couple more laps out here. Oh, well, you still ain't learned your lesson, so let's make a couple more laps. Biggest takeaway from that story that at least that, that I got, if there's areas in your life that you just kind of feel like you're going in circles and you're not really making any progress, it's probably a surrender thing. The Lord's probably telling you, trying to get you to see that so that you, okay, I'm sorry, I did not see that before, but you're right. I should have given that to you a long time ago. And with that, that concludes my part of it. So I just want to close everything in prayer. And if anybody wants to come up, have some, some prayer time or anything like that, you're more than welcome to. Heavenly Father, we come to you again this evening. and We just want to thank you, Lord, for this message. We thank you for how... You worked with all of us to help us to see what you wanted us to see. And we ask, Lord, that you just help us to remember the message that you that you gave to each of us. Help us to apply that in our daily lives. And help us all to surrender back to you, Lord, in the areas where we need to. And as we go through the rest of our weeks, we just invite you to be with us, Lord, and just watch over everyone. Protect everyone. Help everyone to handle anything that comes at them in a manner that's pleasing to you, Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.